Ray, welcome to Validated. Hey, Austin. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on today. So huge fan of the show. Huge fan of the show. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Huge fan of Audius. So be a good one. Um, All right. I'm excited to talk to you today in part because I haven't actually talked to you that much over the years. Um, I know Renil pretty well. We've worked together on a bunch of stuff before. You've obviously been with Audius sort of since the start. Um, so really excited to, to dive in on this conversation today. There's a whole bunch of stuff I want to cover. I want to cover some of the old history of how Audius got started on that sort of migration to Solana, which was sort of a, a very long process, but I think a very thoughtful and, and well thought out process um, of what components of Audius are still on Ethereum, what components are on Solana, how that sort of interplay and migration worked. Um, but I want to start out with sort of the uh, the original thesis and vision for Audius and how that's kind of changed over the years, because you guys are a, a very, if not the first, I would say one of the first non non inherently financial blockchain applications that is still around. Great, great question. There's a there's a lot of ways to kind of go with that. But I think maybe to start off, like. Uh, what Audius is, Audius is a decentralized music marketplace, and that's basically been true since day one. We've we've changed how we think about a lot of the problems that we we deal with and work on, and you know now more than ever have a lot more uh, deep relationships with partners in the music industry at large, which is pretty incredible for a you know crypto project in general. There's you know a lot of stuff going on in music in the Web two space and the Web three space, but uh, you know in particular being sort of a, a dinosaur, as you alluded in the space, has has led us build really strong relationships with a lot of partners. And that's really where we're able to kind of take this idea of a music marketplace and up-level it and working with labels and partners and publishers and performance rights organizations and kind of all the, the rest of the music industry at large. Um, but, you know, the, to answer the question of like, why why does something like Audius exist and what is, you know, the, the mission of it is that we see that in music, the evolution of time, especially with, you know, how we see DSPs today, the Spotify's, the Apple Music's, and so on and so forth, have built many DSPs layers. being digital streaming platforms? Yes. yes, or digital service provider streaming okay. platforms, you can think about it the same way. Um, you know, over time, we've seen just layers and layers of black boxes being built between the artist and the fan that have pulled them further and further apart. And we really see the technology of, of blockchain as a whole, you know, crypto being a piece of that, but, you know, blockchain in general as being the biggest unlock from a technical perspective that we've we've ever seen in this space before. And that can bring in an unprecedented level of openness and transparent transparency and you know direct relationship between artists and fan that you just really can't get anywhere else. And you know, with that, we think we can give artists a bigger say and a lot more control in how they choose to monetize in a marketplace, how they choose to find their fans, whether that is, you know, anything from, hey, I want to charge. Five thousand dollars for my latest album release, and only drop it in the you know Bermuda Triangle for one week, and then remove it, or do something as normal as like, hey, I want to let people you know subscribe to me and listen to content that I upload, you know, for the the sort of you know couple dollars, ten dollars a month that you know is expected elsewhere. And really, like you know, blockchain is a big unlock in that. And you know, as as time has gone on, we've really you know taken our time being patient and thoughtful with UX being the number one priority of what we're doing, and. Um, I think uh, some of this, you know, information is public and you can check out our, our public dashboard for it. You know, we have north of 4 million monthly active users, you know, these days, but the majority of those users don't understand anything about the tech. And that's been really our bread and butter is like, you don't necessarily need to be a crypto native person to enjoy the openness and benefits of what something like blockchain can give to music. And, uh, you know, as as time has gone on, we've obviously move, like you mentioned, from a lot of things from Ethereum to Solana, or we even waited to launch a lot of things until something like Solana existed. And, uh, you know, in general, Solana tends to get a decent amount of like flack from like some parts of the crypto industry being like, oh, that's not how you do it. It has to be much more like, uh, you know, Ethereum, like that's the only way to do things. And, you know, for us, we we really care if it works for users. And that's what we've been yeah. focused on. And that's, you know, why we've moved some things to Solana. And I'm you know happy to talk about that more as we, we keep going here. So I want to I want to kind of start back with something that you said, which is that there's a lot of black boxes out there in the music industry. Uh, I think if you talked to the black boxes in their early days, they would say, no, 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 we're not a opaque black box that siphons off revenue from artists. We are a distribution platform giving them access in ways they never got before to a global market. And we're actually 
giving them a higher percentage of payouts than when they bought CDs. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where very few people see themselves as the problem um, yeah. when you're talking to them. They're seeing themselves as adding value in certain places. And so I, I kind of want to go into a little bit of that that relationship that exists. I mean, I think what most people know today about music streaming is artists are making less money in streaming than they used to make, both either in the early days of streaming or through CD sales. And in exchange, they're making much more money on tour, but they're going on tour much more. So walk me through a little bit of how Audius is set up, both from a philosophical standpoint, a technical standpoint, and maybe an economic standpoint, to do something different than the Spotify's and the Apple Music's and the titles of the world. Totally. Yeah, That's uh, you started with a really interesting point there and in that, you know, kind of this like road to hell is paved with good intentions, yes. right? Like everyone is trying to help everyone. And, you know, artists, big and small, you know, especially big, need teams. There is no doubt about that. Like it is impossible as a musician to manage everything yourself that's on scale. I mean, we see that with technology, of course, all the time, but, you know, that extends very, you know, directly to the to music industry. Um, and I think, you know, what's, what's kind of become the trend recently with this sort of hyper focus on super fans as kind of a way to combat that, you know, like the price, the, the, the value that carries in streaming is, you know, close to zero. There's a really excellent book by Stephen Witt about, you know, it's the, the title of the book is how music became free, pretty much like the modern world, like, you know, consumers who listen to music have gotten so used to things being cheap and instant and cheap to the point where really no one's making much money on streaming. And of course, yes, people are getting pushed to tour more. People are looking for physical and, you know, fi digital and, you know, other ways of merchandising themselves and merchandising their brand in order to make money. Um, what's what's really happened recently because there are so many venues for that is it's very overwhelming for for an artist. Like we've we've heard this feedback a lot from artists we work with and it's like, you know, what's going to get me committed to using a new platform? Am I going to have to manage all of my releases myself? Like the answer, it can't be yes to that. Like we're, we're far past that. People want automated tools to handle all this and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, what does to, to your you know bigger question of like, what does Audius do that's different to, to not be one of these players in this, you know, road, road to hell, so to speak, is that we think by introducing something like the blockchain and a decentralized music protocol under the hood, we make all of the data open. And that's very different from how it works today because, you know, how it might work right now is like, you know, at the end of the month, Spotify sums up, you know, all of the things that they they have accounted for in terms of revenue. There's a bunch of hurdles that they go through. There's, you know, re revenue pool-based things. There's streaming-based things. There's various label cuts. All of that is handled kind of behind the scenes. And, you know, believe it or not, most of this is done over SF2P file transfers today. Like it's so outdated yeah, for the way that, we as consumers, I mean, Spotify is an amazing product. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I use Spotify myself. You can get any song that you want in the entire universe at your fingertips in a second. But what's happening on the back end is is zero transparency. And, you know, I think that's really like what the, the long-term plan is for Audius is to really become a clearinghouse and data broker of understanding how data in music works and mm -hmm. making that open access so that, you know, the players who participate in it, they they can't really, you know, seek out backdoor ways of, of introducing what they're trying to do they actually have to confront the fact that like the information is there and you know let the market work itself out in that sense um and you know i mean there's there's a lot of benefits that we see with that and i think the biggest parallel i could draw certainly for the listeners of, of validated is like you know a lot of this show talks about DeFi and like what is the relationship of DeFi and traditional finance and i, I think that's very similar with what music is and in audience's case you know, I, I don't I haven't heard this term before. Maybe I'll try to coin it, but trad mu or trad music is is maybe the way we'd we'd like to see our role is trying to change up the game. But it's you called know, we, classical music. Ah, uh, classical music. <laughs> well, there's there's a whole Apple app for that now. Um the Apple Music Classical thing is actually really sweet. Yeah, I don't know if great. anyone's checked that out. Yeah. But um music is uh similar and you know the behind the scenes settlement layer is is convoluted and complicated and you know you as a fan and you as an artist like really never see any of that and yeah that's really what we think we can change and that's you know it's a long game to play this takes a lot of time and takes a long time to build things and really like our focus has been pretty much on the ux side to like bring attention to this before you know we we end up you know designing the whole universe and no one's using it so that's that's kind of been our strategy so I want to get into a lot of the technical details and, and, and that stuff as well, but I want to hang on this sort of philosophy and market for a minute because I think this is really key for folks to kind of 
understand. Um, so one of the things I think that is fascinating is the difference between like the K-pop industry and the U.S. music industry, because the K-pop industry is very like intentionally created by brand directors. The performers mm -hmm. are obviously tremendous in terms of what they're able to do, but they're not necessarily the creative control behind the music they make. A lot of that belongs to the creative director of the various group that they're creating. They're, they're, there's something more akin to yeah. the way actors are in Hollywood, where they don't necessarily control the movies they're in, but they obviously have exceptional performances within that. I don't want anyone in the K-pop world to get mad at me. Um, <laughs> But you know, there is a, a, a very data-driven artistic process there, which is uh, coming to the United States and coming to the, the wider music industry, certainly. But I think we would sort of, we, we have this idea that like Taylor Swift is not a data-driven artist. And of course, Taylor Swift is a deeply data-driven artist, but there's that sort of, at least veneer of, of a different type of authenticity, even among our superstars um, nowadays. So I'm kind of curious how many artists are responding to this idea that like we can now get much more data like like the of the people who are actually choosing to publish their music on Audius what is their sort of their rationale and feedback cuz I think a lot of journalists would say when we got more data about journalism journalism actually got worse. Mm. Well yeah this is a really fantastic question and uh I think we're going to see more of this especially with how easy creation has become recently, you know, with, with all of the improvements in the AI landscape and yeah. all of the, uh, you know, just efficiencies in general in producing music, creating about AI, but even the, you know, digital audio workstation, like the things Ableton's done in the last decade have been, you know, pretty incredible and lowered the barrier to entry to making music quite a lot. Um, I think that our our philosophy really at, at Audius on this is that we we want to serve the the industry and the market, and we want to serve both the small and the large in that. So you know whether you are K-pop and you are part of a you know essentially a, a company that's producing the the end product, or if you're an individual who sits in your bedroom and is able to use some of the tools that exist now to to produce really high quality music, that you're equally given opportunity by the fact that the data is there and the access is there, yeah. and you know we. We do see, you know, over time that uh, not everyone wants all of the data. And it's almost like not really the point as like an end artist. Like if you're small enough that like, you know, it's sufficient for you to just see who's bought your music and you know, have access to reach out to those fans and build that fandom, like that might be enough. And maybe you don't need to know that the, the whole audience is architected in a way that is totally decentralized and that you could run a node yourself and actually have all the data and indexing it, you know, that that would be really cool if you wanted to do that as a hobbyist, but like, that's really not the the point of the overall mission, which is really to like fit in this technology into the industry in a place where it can act as an unlock for big and small parties to make decisions on it. And, you know, there's lots of schools of thought on like whether this AI change is going to make music less good or like lower quality. And, you know, I, I think at, at Audius, we don't really need to take a stance on that, but we do want to unlock the ability for people to use technology in whichever ways they, they see most most effective to their own plan. And, you know, oftentimes an artist who has a cult following of a thousand users who are able to pay them is is sufficient. And like, that's what they want. And being able to own that fandom and be able to talk to those fans and work with those fans and understand the data just about those fans is, is enough. Yeah. So I'd love to get into to that a little bit. Um, you know, you guys have, what, about a four million user user base that's like fairly active at this point. What are those people like? What's their relationship with artists like? I'm sure some are just pure consumers, but like walk me through a little bit about how the artist and, you know, listener relationship is both similar and different from other sort of digital platforms. Yeah, totally. So, you know, you can think of Audius as more similar to SoundCloud and Bandcamp in the landscape of DSPs. Yeah. Um, you know, over time, platforms like SoundCloud have become a little bit more Spotify looking than what they originally were. There were features on SoundCloud around communities and stuff maybe uh, a decade or so ago. Yeah, this was like the whole Apple Music when it launched was like a social platform as well. And then that lasted like uh, three months. Yeah, we've we've seen that happen a lot. And, you know, I think part of that is because there's just this like massive you know, gravity of, of how people have come to expect music today that, that is, you know, just very, very native. And for us, like we, we don't want to deviate 
from that and stick to our principles of allowing people to build social relationships on a music platform. Like music is inherently social. It may not be social in the scale of what Spotify does today. And I, you know, I think that's that's okay. You could build a Spotify like experience on top of Audius, and you can build a Bandcamp like experience on top of Audius. And like our product as a you know first party client looks more like Bandcamp today. And you know, our primary audience is independents. And a lot of folks are, you know, working on bringing on their catalog and connecting with fans and we support, you know, messaging and that messaging is, you know, decentralized and end-to-end encrypted, which is really awesome. And, you know, there's, there's some really cool tech powering these things, but ultimately like in this new wave of music becoming uh, a coworker of mine recently used the phrase uh, like zombie internet. There's a lot of stuff. I, I don't know if you've been on Pinterest recently. Uh, I certainly don't go on Pinterest very often, but when I do, you know, like a lot of content is, is AI generated now. And I think we're starting to see that in a lot of places where where things are becoming a lot more sterile to your point before about giving, you know, journalism got worse when there was data, like things are becoming sterile and we kind of want audience to be open and free and, you know, in, in some senses kind of Burning Man-esque to, to bring out like, you know, the, the social and human facet of what music is. Yeah. I, I think that's like very, very interesting from like a, like a philosophical and like almost, you don't see many companies that are built around a Burning Man aesthetic. <laughs> Although in crypto, you may see more than than I think in a lot of traditional tech industries. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I walk me through a little bit of like, it seems like there's a lot of these different types of components that are a, a very different way to build a product, a very philosophically different way to approach these sorts of things. What about Audius really requires blockchain technology or blockchain technology makes viable in a way that wouldn't be otherwise? Totally. I, you know, I think it, you mentioned this at the beginning of your your first question, which is around what are the sort of economic incentives and the yeah. economic fabric of Audius, and that that really is important to us. Like we we want to build a protocol that can withstand the test of time and withstand even like our contributions as a you know, contributing company to it, and be fully owned and operated by a community that are incentivized to do so. And so when we set out on building Audius, like everything that we did was decentralized first always. And that was, you know, one of the reasons why it was, it took, you know, a while to even get our first product out the door because, you know, there are a lot of hard questions to ask. And, you know, you can kind of think about Audius in some ways as like a layer one for music. Yeah, of course, you know, we use Solana and we use Ethereum. We're not a layer one blockchain, but like we, we are trying to provide, you know, this clearinghouse type model, this like, you know, open transaction book of what's going on in music. And we felt, you know, we could only do that in a way where, like, we weren't the sole party who, you know, was running all of the infrastructure and power of that. Like, yeah. that, you know, kind of does exist today. There are entities that act as, um, you know, sort of middlemen that help DSPs translate data to and from publishers and performance rights organizations, other players in the industry. Um, you know, and that exists today, but none of it is is open in the way that something like economically incentivized crypto projects can can be. And, you know, the way this works on Audius today is... We have a main governance protocol that lives on on mainnet Ethereum, and on that, uh, node operators who basically run our software are registering services, and they're earning you know staked interest on a you know token that we have, and that is how the sort of like base economic layer of Audius works. And that says nothing about the user story, and like you know most of our users don't really know anything about Ethereum, they don't care about it, and that's like where Solana has really come into the picture for us as a huge unlock because that's where we built all of the cool social experiences and the like in-product stuff and all the ways that you can monetize your music and control who has access to your music and do that all in a way that's very seamless. Um, so really, like we build, we build on blockchains, not to build on blockchains, but we want to build this open, you know, sort of like record book of music. And the only way that we see possible to do that in the you know, long run that will withstand the test of time is by building it on-chain. Um, and you know we're we're multi-chain or chain agnostic or something like that. If you you know you want to use some some terminology, um, but we want to pick the best tool for the job. And it's not like you know users who got comfortable with not having to log into their music player every time like know about session cookies and know all those details. Like that doesn't matter, right? Like the the thing that matters is like what they're getting out of it. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit of the the tech. So I want to go through sort of two different uh, user journeys here to use some very product marketing language here and product Love language it. but let's start from the perspective of like i'm an artist uh and i've never used audius before but like i want to i want to get my music listed i want to upload stuff so you know not 
you know, necessarily like what buttons do I press, but like, what am I doing when I register? Where am I uploading music to? Uh, and then so just sort of walk me through the, the technical journey that like my my wave file takes. Totally. Uh, yeah, I love that you're uploading lossless too with the wave file. Of um, so yeah, you come to Audius, you may use our first party client that lives at audius.co or that, you know, is our, our apps on the Google Play and Apple, you know, app stores. And your first experience looks almost identical to Web2. It's a username and password login or an email and password login. Um, behind the scenes, you are getting a wallet. And we have a pretty cool setup for how that works. That wallet actually is an Ethereum wallet because that's where we started. But the, the really interesting thing is behind the scenes from that, we're actually creating derived accounts on Solana for you to receive payouts in USDC oh, cool. to hold our native audio token on the, the Solana bridged asset through Wormhole. And all this stuff is all happening behind the scenes. You don't care about it at all. Like you're busy signing up and picking, you know, what genres you want to follow and like what artists you want to follow and, you know, what kinds of experience you want to have at the platform. Do you want to upload music first or do you want to join as a fan? But so, you know, you go through that sign up process. It looks and feels very web too. And that's done with high intention. It's very you know important that we do that because again, like most of our users don't really know anything. They hit audience.co because they hear about it from their you know, favorite producer they're following or their friend who also produces music or, you know, they themselves have heard about it from, you know, some billboard article that's written about us and they come in as a musician, you know, just wanting to use yeah. the product. So all of this stuff behind the scenes is going on, um, creating a wallet for them. And, you know, they, they land on a page that says upload your music and they go upload their music. And what, what actually happens there is that um, they talk to mainnet Ethereum, which is where our sort of governance and registration system lives and they actually like discover who are the node operators that are running on it. So this is all hot happening behind the scenes. You know, they're just looking yeah, at a pretty course. little upload dialogue, right? Um, and they basically pick two different things. There's uh, two node types that live within Audius. One of them is this thing called the discovery node, which essentially is like how you find content in Audius, kind of this like search and explore type service. And the other one is this thing called the content node, which is where we store all of our audio files. So that, you know, to your question before is where the wave file ends up being. But behind the scenes, you don't actually know about this at all. Like you basically log in, you have, uh, you know, a wallet behind the scenes. You're able to like prove your identity to the network by cryptographically signing things. And you you send your wave file to this one of these content nodes. The content node is, is you know, earning on the protocol through this staking mechanism. So they're happy to take your file and transcode it and, you know, make a streamable version of it and make a few other different copies, generate a preview if you want. And, you know, you specify like, hey, I want to make sure that Whenever someone wants this song, they have to pay a dollar. And, you know, the standard payment in Audius is actually USDC. And that's done also with intention. Like, yes, we have our own token, but like, you're not going to know anything. About it. If you don't know anything about crypto and you land on an upload page and it's like, oh, you're going to make all this audio, you're going to be like, what does that actually right. mean? Um, so you know, say like, audio. Hey, <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you say like on that, that sort of upload form, hey, like I want to charge people a dollar to access my content or let them stream it for free, charge them a dollar to download the, the WAV file, the lossless original or master copy. Um, I, as an artist, like finish the upload form, I send my content to one of these content nodes, and then I publish the record that I did so onto the chain. And then that ends up being kind of the way that the rest of the network like indexes and discovers that content and makes it available to any other streamers. And that's where that kind of discovery node type that I was talking about before comes into play because it's you know basically listening to ETH, it's listening to Solana, it's listening to some other communication layers that we have, and it's basically stitching together a picture of the universe so that someone can search across it. You know, we use Elasticsearch behind the scenes to power this. Um, but you know that really just leads to like a pretty seamless like Web two style interface where you, you upload yeah. a song, it's pay gated. Some come along and buy it, and you know when they buy it, they pay you directly in crypto, direct user to user, wallet to wallet behind the scenes, and the the sort of discovery nodes in the network and the content nodes in the network basically you know attest to hey a user should have access to this. Let's serve it to them. Yeah, you know it's funny because I think if you came to Audius today and you download the app, you sign in, you install it, et cetera. You would think it's using Web3 the same way like a game from 2022 is using Web3, hmm. where it's like, oh, there's a sign in with wallet button and I've earned some tokens, but everything else is just running on AWS somewhere. But it sounds like that's really not the technology experience. Yes. Uh, that I thank you for realizing that. And that's, you know, what I was trying to allude to before and that, you know, our whole goal was build it decentralized first and do that always. Like, you know, we do take a good amount of, you know, academic rigor to how we think about this problem. And yes, it's so much easier. Hey, let's just make a giant S3 bucket and let everyone put their files there and just, you know, serve it back with, you know, S3's version of, you know, gated link URLs and things like that. And 
you know, our, our whole stance is that if this is going to stand the test of time and become this open, you know, block book essentially for music, it needs to be operated this way and it needs to be run this way. And so we spent a lot of time sweating those details and, you know, the content storage system itself has gone through many different iterations. And, you know, the one that we've landed on recently, I think has been a really awesome implementation in, in Go. And again, I mean, anyone could implement this thing however they want, like there is a spec for it. And, you know, there, we hope in similar ways, I think, uh, Pretty recently, I was re-listening to the validated episode where you guys had Syndica come on to talk about their uh, their validator client that they're building for for Solana itself. And like, you know, this is where we see necessarily music going. Like, the internet is a fundamental primitive of our lives, and there's no reason that music should not be treated as you know something that deserves its own protocol. Yeah, I, uh, there's so many so many questions I have off of just that statement alone. Um, I, I I am fascinated by the concept of protocolization. Um, largely because almost no one's done it successfully yet. Um, but it, it's a very interesting idea that, like, there is something behind the scenes that becomes an audio protocol that is basically a royalty system that follows you everywhere you are on the Internet, right? Like, there, there, there's a, there's a, uh, so right now we, we sort of have this, like, very loose royalty system where I, I think Spotify famously has several billion dollars in an account somewhere that it doesn't know who it owes money to, but it knows it owes it to someone. Um, just because the royalty tracking system is very poor across, across you know, music catalogs in general. But this idea that, you know, maybe I'm going to a streaming website, uh, like a video streaming website, but I'm using a sample in my music that, that in my video that comes from a song that's stored on Audius and like the, the music payment protocol can exist outside of the music app is something that really hasn't um, happened in the Web 2 world today. Uh, yeah. But you, it, it's very similar to like what Teleport is doing for ride sharing. It's, it's sort of that idea of like the front end of Teleport is in some ways the product, but like the API product is like the actual product. It's the ability for like the Uber app to tie into the Teleport protocol and the, you know, the local car ride sharing company in Texas can tie into the Teleport protocol. And when you open the app in you know, New York, you can still hit the teleport network. Like, is that sort of what you guys are thinking of in terms of like a, an audio protocol for the internet over the long term? It is exactly. And I think that's a, that's a great analogy. And if, you know, if I'm to break the fourth wall a little bit and say, if there's anything that I want anyone listening to this episode of Validated to get from is that you should come build on Audius. You know, we have an open protocol with open SDKs that you can use or rewrite to your liking and build whatever client interface on top of that. And, you know, recently in the last, I would say, year to two years of work, we've been focused a lot on the, the monetary product. And that's more than just, you know, what we offer in our interface, which, you know, has a bunch of green buttons with dollar signs before it if you want to buy something. But, you know, behind the scenes, there's this pretty robust system of proving access to be able to, to, to listen to certain content. And, you know, using our SDKs, like if you want to spin up a client that focuses on one particular feature, or one particular niche of music, I mean, we're seeing tons of that now with the the vaults and the, the Sunos and like, you know, there's lots of, you know, music apps that are taking pretty opinionated perspectives on like how people should and can listen to music. Um, we want to encourage that. And all you have to do is really just encode rules about how content should be accessed. And then users can prove whether they satisfy those conditions or not. And, you know, that's as anything as simple as like, hey, I sent one USDC to you and it showed up on chain. And we know that that happened across the audience network. So, you know, any app building it can just basically take your wallet address behind the scenes and prove like, yes, you should be able to stream this song, but it can get arbitrarily complicated. And that's really, I think, where the power of this model comes into play is that artists can choose how they want to monetize. And that might look totally different artist to artist, and it might look totally different application to application. And applications may choose to like be like, hey, you know, we only want to serve the drum and bass community and we're going to build something very tailored to drum and bass. And we're going to have all these really interesting like payment gates and restrictions of how you can access content or, you know, to take dubstep as a model, there's a huge community around this, you know, this yep. notion of like dub plates and like where you get your samples that you, you know, put into your dubstep songs and all that kind of stuff. And those custom experiences with like arbitrary amount of like on-chain gating can happen. And that's really where we see the power of a protocol existing. Cause like, yeah, we're, we're fragmented across different ways of consuming music today. CD sales are up in the last year. It's crazy. Like, I don't know where that came from, but, um, you know, we're, we're not trying to take an opinion. We will with our first party client, but like as a protocol, like we really want this to just be the open record of how music works and let anyone build whatever kind of experience they want to build on top of that. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting kind of vision for what this this can be. Because, like, I you know, one of the things I uh, I have moved mu- music services three times, sort of since I started the streaming era, uh, from Spotify to Apple and to Tidal. Um, and a lot of that's been driven by, I think, the quality of curation, um, which seems to get worse every year and sort of more incentivized financially every year. So it's kind of interesting to think about that perspective that you could even have like curation modules that you pay for that plug into this experience where, um, you know, like by building an open platform, it means there's not only more openness in terms of clients like you were talking about, but it means people can almost monetize the content indirectly in different ways too. Like I could subscribe to a playlist curation service or something along those lines. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, I think it's it's resonant of your your point earlier about journalism too. Like, you know, we just saw Pitchfork kind of get folded in a little yeah. bit and that was probably, you know, the best, at least if you're an, you know, an indie head, like the best curation in, in music that, you know, we've certainly seen in the last, you know, couple decades. But um, yeah, to, to your point exactly, there is nothing standing in the way of someone building a well-monetized, well-structured, well-incentivized fandom around curation entirely. And we've had a lot of conversations about this internally, about some of the features that we have coming up that we're launching that we're really excited about. But I can't wait for someone to take the audience protocol, user SDKs, and build a playlist forward curation experience that they're able to make money from. And yeah. You know, people do pay for curation. People go to live shows, like you mentioned before. And, you know, DJs are basically curators. They're extremely talented and oftentimes musicians themselves, but they're extremely good at reading their audience and playing music that resonates with them. And, you know, to your point about live music being one of the major revenue sources now, like, you know, that that exists because people need curation. People like curation. And especially in this world of, uh, you know, AI music and a lot of, you know, noise to signal or signal to noise, whichever way you want to draw the comparison, like, finding that signal is really important. And, yeah. you know, we, we do fundamentally believe that there is a, you know, at least in today's world, a necessarily human element to that. Yeah, I think that's a really, like, nice way to look at that and sort of, like, a, a, a good value positive statement for how we want this this music industry to head. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the usage of the platform today, the artists that are on it, the growth you guys have, have experienced, kind of where things are headed. But I want to start with that kind of uh, that catalog experience and sort of the artist experience when they're uploading music. So are you finding these are like Bandcamp uh, and SoundCloud, I think very famously became sort of like the B-sides, that you'd, you'd release mm-hmm. your main music and you'd upload it to Spotify and Apple and Tidal and YouTube and all the main platforms. And then there'd sort of be like the fan extras would be on SoundCloud. And maybe you went mm-hmm. in or Bandcamp and you'd maybe go and you'd buy an album um, but your your primary experience was was largely on other platforms, and it was almost like the super fans who were going and finding distribution in these other areas. Uh, yeah. Is that sort of the way you find p- artists are interacting with Audius? Are they doing Audius exclusives? Uh, what what's the type of music you're seeing actually uploaded? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I think that generally is kind of the the bread and butter of of where we we operate today. It's it's mostly people who are putting exclusives or putting the b-sides or putting the extra things that they think they can squeeze value out of you know onto a platform like audius and likely posting on things like bandcamp and soundcloud too as well one of the most interesting things that they've been doing recently is doing pre-releases and publishing things uh to audius and you know similar platforms before they go on spotify and so on and so forth in order to build deeper relationships with their fans and you know that has been a really cool like interesting emergent product behavior we've seen one of the other things that's worked really well for us that's uh, been a novel sort of feature offering is the ability to do these remix competitions where you upload files and stem files and other pieces of content that you know you use to create your works yourself. And then for your fans who are also creators, for them to be able to use those things and participate in you know direct engagement and as an artist, there's nothing better than you know to build a super fan than have someone use your own source material to make music on top of it. You know that's, yeah. that's a really great way to reach your audience. And so we've seen people do you know pay gated remix competitions where they would have to you know the the creator has to buy you know the original track and they get a download kit alongside that and then they can re-upload things and those get associated in a really cool way, like all publicly on chain and that you know like you can see this sort of music ontology, so to speak, of you know, where this, you know, remixed track came from and the creators getting paid and building fandom out of that. So uh, 
you know, to your, to your original point, like, yes, like we really do tend to thrive in this sort of super fan arena, but um, in this sort of like changing tides of how music and the internet are going right now, we really uh, want to bring in an unprecedented level of social into that. And a lot of the emergent behavior has kind of been in response to some of the things we've been putting out in the social space. So from a, from a growth perspective, is your goal to get Audius to the place where it is the primary release? Or do you think that the sort of, what, what is missing in, in either the technology stack, the market stack, the landscape right now, the adoption of Web3, knowledge of the platform that's keeping Audius from going from 4 million users to 400 million users? Uh, great question. Um, of course, there are some you know technical hurdles. I think the the kind of good news for us is that the way we've built Audius is that we don't necessarily need Web three adoption as a whole to skyrocket yeah. for Audius adoption to skyrocket, and that's you know really where we see you know Anatoly certainly talks about this all the time of like how you know Solana is building a blockchain to build killer consumer applications, yes. and you know I, I don't think he says oh these are killer consumer Web three applications. He says killer consumer applications and you know that's that's what we would like to have happen for audience and we would you know would love obviously you know 400 million users would be incredible and that is what we have our our eyes set on um but you know that that takes time and that's why you know while we have been iterating on and shipping a lot of first party you know independent artist focused fan relationship building features we've also been building up really you know deep relationships with the music industry at large and working to get the catalog that does enable us to get the the primary releases and stuff. So, um, you know, to, to use some of this sort of like music industry lingo there, like Audius is becoming a fully licensed music streaming platform. And that's uh, okay. very different from what, you know, Audius started out as, you know, being this kind of scrappy like Web3 product, but it is, you know, a necessary one in order to grow to be competitive with the, you know, DSP landscape that exists today. Yeah. So, so how would that work? I assume, so most of the traditional music industry runs on, very complex systems of different types of royalties that all interplay in in you know we we it, it makes the makes a you know the mortgage industry look transparent um in terms of like the level of of different components involved in that so yeah. uh, give me a little bit of a sense of how a deeply vertically integrated licensing regime uh can mesh with a decentralized protocol like Audius. how do those two worlds come if not close together closer enough together Brilliant question. So, you know, imagine that we've we've done what we've done so far in building Audius off the ground and that it is a decentralized, like node operated ecosystem of of music metadata and music files. Now, in order to get content on from, you know, labels both big and small, you know, they typically the way this works in the music industry today is through this standard called DDEX. Um, which stands for Digital Data Exchange. Uh, and it and really basically is like giant XML files that have a bunch of metadata about music and either FTP or S3 buckets that actually have the files and those get ingested, you know, periodically by the likes of Spotify and Apple Music and so on and so forth. Um, so we what we've done with that is built a really cool system where our, our labs are very similar to how Solana is set up with the foundation and a, and a labs entity. Our labs group is working on onboarding the sort of like traditional music partners onto the Audius protocol by basically providing a you know white glove first hand experience of like, hey, we support DDEX and we will work with the you know existing systems to help onboard content into the Audius catalog. But at the same time, we've built all of this tooling to be open source so that anyone could come in and be a distributor to Audius and they could generate their own, you know, DDEX compliant XML files that express the releases and push that all into the Audius catalog. So from the like content ingestion side, like we can enrich in the sort of metadata that lives in the Audius protocol by working with the existing standards that exist across the industry. Yeah. And then on the the sort of like backend side of it, you know, the question is like, you know, that you mentioned before, all the revenue streams and rights holders and, you know, various things like, again, our, our labs group is working to, you know, onboard those partners into what Audius is. But what's really cool about Audius is that because the data lives on chain and because the data is governed and controlled by this you know, large network of, of node operators, anyone can build a service that can slice and dice the data in the ways that they want. And they have, you know, access just as, you know, anyone else would to the metadata of the catalog. And usually that metadata is what determines how things get paid out and how revenue gets collected. And one of the really cool things that we've built on Solana in the last year or so is this thing that we've called the payment router, which is a obscenely simple on-chain program. Like, you know, we we actually had it audited by Neodyme and the first thing they said to us is like, why does this even need to be a program? And like, and so it's a great question because all it is is like, 
you know, you basically pass to the program, hey, I'm paying $1 for this track and here are the splits for that track. And the program basically pays the people who are, you know, recipient splits. So it kind of acts as this, you know, conduit on chain to like do the payout. And, you know, this, does, you know, you could just send 50% to one wallet and 50% to the other wallet and totally like not need a, you know, on-chain program for it. The reason we built a program to do it is because, um, not to use the the sort of like curse word centralization, but it adds like a single point of entry in which payments flow through Audius. And you can look it up in a program and you right. can see like, hey, this is an Audius payment that happened. And then anyone who's indexing can plug in a single address and all of a sudden index like all of the payments that happen and they can get all the derivative payouts. And, you know, over time, the hope is that we bring on the industry to work on top of Audius and then deepen those integrations over time. And, you know, to the point where like, players both on the release side and on the usage side can understand that, you know, this is how you work with this data standard. Yeah, I, I do want to hang on the fact that there's probably 400 people at Spotify who just handle the payments and payout systems. Uh, and you've done it in a smart contract. Thank you. Uh, that that definitely means a lot. And it's, you know, only like a 50 or 60 line smart contract too. <laughs> I mean, that's the beauty of, of Solana too. And, you know, certain ways it's it's a blessing and a curse the way you, you know, specify accounts when you, you know, talk yeah. to programs, but it actually makes following data really easy yeah. and really user-friendly. And that's really what we're out, you know, to do. So so let's fast forward a little bit to a future where maybe there's more traditional artist catalog work on Spotify. How does the payment work at that point? Because there's no sort of, at least the last time I... I poked around with Audius seriously, which was a few months ago, there was no subscription system there, no monthly fee there. I assume that a bunch of these artists, while they may love to be on more platforms, they're not particularly excited to get audio tokens and there's no ads currently, right? So so how yeah. does that sort of business side of it work when you're dealing with like, you know, Sony and, and Universal? Totally. Yeah. Great, great question. I would say, you know, for the most part, we're still bootstrapping the whole like marketplace economics of what Audius is, but the sort of like long-term vision for how this goes is that, you know, on chain, there's a specification for how every single piece of content should be accessed. Maybe that specification is like, this belongs in a subscription. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our positioning is not like, Hey, you're going to take a subscription with the Audius protocol at large. There's no reason we couldn't do something like that, but, um, you know, there still exists like a lot of monetary content that's done as, as singles, as one-offs, as like direct, you know, Patreon yeah. style subscriptions to artists. And like, over time, we see that becoming the predominant way where there is most of the money in music. Like, I think, you know, the, as far as, you know, money is concerned, the $10 a month for access to everything is not, is not the biggest part of the pie. And we're seeing that with, you know, the, the rise of independence and like, you know, just generally how much super fan, how much money lives in the super fandom and how much money lives in merchandising and touring and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but you know, like we, there's no reason you couldn't build an ad supported platform on top of Audius and use the revenue there in for yourself as like supporting whatever client you're building. And then behind the scenes, like, you know, you're only accessing the free catalog or you're only accessing a subset of the catalog. You know, we really don't want to limit anything there, um, as far, as far as how people decide to pay for and access content. But, you know, everything is really kind of homed in on this sort of access pattern where some payment has to happen. And it's why we've chosen USDC mostly as like the right. way people directly pay each other with, you know, a eventuality where a, you know, portion of that is kicked back to the rest of the network. Right now it, it takes place in the form of inflation, but like the people who are running the network are earning on the audio token, which is, you know, essentially like directly tied to how the network is growing overall. Yeah. You know, it's, there's two things I'm thinking of. One is we just wrapped up an episode with uh, the Sanctum folks. And so there's a lot of interesting models where I stake a certain amount of soul or ether or audio tokens and the interest off of that actually pays for my subscriptions for me. Um, the other one that's interesting to think about is, you know, uh, like how much would I pay per month for access to a whole artist's catalog? Maybe I don't need everything, right? But I, I would actually engage on like a maybe $1 a month to access the entire snarky puppy discography in Flack or something like that. We love snarky puffy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are plenty of fans who are like that, who yeah. would want the lossless version of every you know snarky puppy studio session that exists. Because I mean, like, as far as quality goes, I don't think there's anything that beats that. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think that we've, we've seen this on Audius and we've seen evidence with other platforms like Patreon that like, or even, you know, OnlyFans, like we, we see that people are willing to pay subscription fees to individual creators. And I think like overall, we're moving much more towards this like creator consumer economy rather than the like, you know, there is one artist that everyone listens to that distributes through this one channel. I think it's going to become a lot more fragmented. And I think, um, trying to make sure that we build the best tools to lead into that is, is really like our goal and let people, you know, figure out, you know, for themselves, whether it is a better strategy for, you know, in the Sarky Puppy case for them to monetize off of Flax directly to Austin or for them to decide to monetize elsewhere, you know, mostly focus on doing tours and shows. And really like, you know, we, we stand to empower the artists and basically taking control of their destiny in that and figuring out like, what is the monetary model that works the best for them? Cause not, it's not one size fits all for sure. Yeah. I, I think that's a, I'm looking forward to seeing what those sort of economic experiments look like in the future. Um, I think there's a huge design space available for sort of taking these concepts of like, oh, can we stake something and get something in return? Or can we build a direct relationship with a creator, in this case, a musician through a platform like Audius? Um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of interesting stuff to explore into the future there. Yeah. But Ray, uh, before we let you go here, Give, give folks a bit of an overview. If they're musicians, where do they start? If they're developers and want to, you know, they're inspired to build some of this stuff, how can they get involved? Awesome. Yeah, great way to close it out. Um, if you are an artist or a fan of music, you know, I'm sure probably everyone who listens to this podcast is consuming music some way or another. If you're, you know, here listening, uh, go to audius.co, make an account, check out some of the artists that are there selling things, listing things for free, hosting remix competitions. Um, definitely take a look there. And if you're a developer who's interested in building on this and building the next killer music app experience and have some great idea about the stuff we talked about today around like monetized playlists, go to docs.audius.org and take a look at our SDKs there and definitely reach out, join our Discord. If you have you know questions, we would love to help you build on what we're doing. Awesome. Well, Ray, thank you for joining us today on Validated. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Austin. Awesome.